Hey everybody, I'm David Guggenheim, sometimes known as the Ocean Doctor. I'm a senior fellow at the Ocean Foundation and I am really excited about this panel and I hope you are too because this is something critically important. Before I start, I have to give a huge thanks to David Helvarg, Mary Kadelsky, and especially to the most awesome human being on the earth, Margot Pellegrino. I thought it would be great to do an education panel. I volunteered to do all the work and I promptly left for the Antarctic and Cuba and haven't been seen since. Um, and Margot really saved the day. She organized this panel while I was gone, so I have the easy job of just standing up here and, um, and interacting with some pretty amazing folks here. Author Richard Louv, who wrote Last Child in the Woods and founder of the Children and Nature Network, said in his book, within the space of a few decades, the way children understand and experience nature has changed radically. The polarity of the relationship has reversed. Today, kids are aware of the global threats to the environment, but their physical contact, their intimacy with nature is fading. And that's exactly the opposite of what many of us in this room experienced when we were kids. The amount of time that the average American kid spends outdoors in unstructured play with the natural world around him or her has been reduced to something on the order of about four minutes. Many of us who are older find this really, really tough to wrap our heads around. I mean, when we were kids, we have, I'm sure many of us have fond memories of tearing through the neighborhood on our bikes, jumping into the creeks, and the object was to stay out as late as possible and to get as dirty as possible. And those days are really largely gone for a large number of kids in the country today. As many of you know, for my 50th birthday, I set off on a journey to visit schools in all 50 states and US territories. And I'm still on that expedition. I've hit 17 states and one US territory, so lots to go. But it's been a wonderful, you know, life-changing experience for me. And um, you know, the idea is to bring my experiences as a marine scientist um, to these schools and also to promote careers in science, something that we have lost in this country, a lot of uh, interest in science careers. But I'm learning, I think, way more from these kids than they're learning from me. I'm learning about, I'm really able to put my pulse on to what's happening out there. And it's, it's true what Richard Louvre is observing is definitely true and especially true of our oceans. Ocean deficit disorder exists, partially due to geography. Not everybody lives close to an ocean, but that doesn't explain all of it. In Florida, I've taught young people who live within a mile of the beach, but have never been in the water. You know, kids 11 years old, never been in the water. In Naples, where I, I lived for several years, young minority kids had never been to the beach, not even standing on the beach, because in their minds, this was the turf of the rich white person. It wasn't their place to be on those beaches. Don't, don't worry, we got them to the beach as part of an after school program. My own experience as a 15 year old from Philadelphia attending sea camp in the Florida Keys and getting plopped into 37 feet of water at Lou Key and seeing fish swimming around my head and coral reefs around me that was literally a life-changing experience that I remember vividly right now um, because it was, it was real. It was a real experience. And this has, has stayed with me and taught me that 
young people and frankly kids of all ages desperately need experiences, real experiences with Mother Nature on her terms to experience the awe and wonder and unpredictability and yes, even the danger of nature if we expect them to care. It's today more than ever, it's too easy to grow up without even realizing how intimately connected we are to the natural world around us in, in important ways and that what we humans choose to do or not to do matters profoundly. Our panel today will explore the critically important topic of education as it relates to our oceans. And as I once said when I was working on Everglades issues, I said that the, uh, you know, and it applies to other large-scale environmental issues like climate change or ocean acidification where we've got work to do over a period of decades. The decision makers we need to reach today and tomorrow are still wearing diapers. You know, we've got to think long term and that means starting our attention, putting our attention to education from the very beginning when kids are young because these, if they're not growing up with that fire in their, in their heart for the way we feel it, for the oceans or whatever, um, we're going to have a hard job to do. We're in extremely lucky today. We've got an amazing panel. We've got students. We've got teachers, we've got East Coast, and we've got West Coast. So I'm going to start by introducing Kyle Thurman. Say hi. Hi. Kyle is, <laughs> Kyle is um, if you hadn't guessed, one of the younger people on the panel. He is a young professional surfer from Santa Cruz, California, go slugs who uh, rallies surfers and consumers to become more aware of the power that they have to affect changes in their communities and worldwide. His project tracing consumer um, deposits at large US banks to funding environmentally destructive projects, Claim Your Change, helped convince depositors to transfer $100 million from large banks to community-based neighborhood banks and in 2010, Kyle received the prestigious Peter Benchley Ocean Award for Youth Activism for his work. Welcome, Kyle Thurman. Thank you. So, do we show your Yeah. Video? Uh, go for it. Okay. We're going to start with a, with a video. Serving for change. My name is Kyle Tierman. <laughs> Up until recently, when I'd go skating, I'd bring a plot. Okay. We've got this under control. <laughs> Welcome to Serving for Change. My name is Kyle Tierman. Up until recently, when I'd go skating, I'd bring a plastic bottle of water with me. When I'd come in from surfing and grab a burrito, I'd take it out in a plastic bag. But then something changed. I took an incredible trip to the North Shore of Oahu. The waves are amazing and it's a beautiful place, but I had no idea that the decisions I make at home have an effect on the people of Hawaii. The Hawaiian Islands are almost like a filter out here in the Pacific Ocean for plastic. It's not like where you just throw the bottle in the trash and you never have to think about it again or the plastic bag and you don't think about it again. Here, if you just go to the east side of the island, you'll know exactly where it all goes. Wait a sec. Is he talking about this plastic bag? They're like toxic tumbleweeds. You know, they just blow out. And so even when they go to landfills, whereas, which is where the majority of plastic goes, 
they blow out and they go out to sea and then they swirl in these gyres and they end up like in Hawaii. There's no limit to them in terms of globally how far the damages of plastic reach. The dolphins, the sea turtles, the albatross. Literally millions die because they mistake plastic bags for jellyfish and they swallow it and then they regurgitate it and feed it to their young and the young can't do anything so it kills them. But I recycle my plastic bag, so where does that go? The American Chemistry Council, which is the lobbying arm of the plastics industry, wants you to say, just recycle, just recycle. And we should recycle. But less than 5% of all single-use plastics are ever recycled. I took a trip to Oahu's recycling center. I found out that they just send it halfway around the world for someone else to deal with. The little recycling symbol on the bottom of plastics doesn't indicate that it has been recycled or will be recycled. Reduce, reuse, become before recycling. Recycling is the last option we do. Is there a better alternative than recycling my bottle of water? For a while I thought bottled water was a safer choice and then I learned it's not even there. Bottled water is less regulated than tap water. There's one person in the entire country that's supposed to monitor the whole bottled water industry. They feel toxic to me to touch now, like it's been so long since I've been using them. It's a huge scam. It's, am it's amazing that they got they've gotten away with it. I cruised around Oahu and found out that there are businesses all over going plastic free. I started having my sales girls say, do you need a bag? And half or more of the people say no. And it feels good to walk into a place and be like, I don't need that. I have my own bag. And I'll be at the hardware store and be like, oh, I forgot to bring a bag and then they'll be putting it in the plastic bag, and I'm like, no, no, I can't do it, and I gotta put the duct tape here, and like, okay, all this junk over here, and like try to carry it out of the store. You make a fool of yourself sometimes, but it's, you know, it's whatever, it's, it's a good challenge. Let's take this challenge on. What habits can you change to make your life less plastic? I'm gonna start bringing my own bottle to the skate park, and next time I get a burrito, I'm bringing my own bag. For more simple solutions that have a big impact, type in Surfing for Change next time you're on Facebook. So there's a song I wrote for uh, World Water Day a couple years back about trying to get rid of uh, single-use plastic water bottles. There's really no need to be such a fancy pants. Put down the plastic water bottles, give the kids a chance, cause the next generation is growing. We gotta be knowing that if we're consuming, we gotta be doing what we can do to reduce our waste. And the best thing to do is don't use single-use plastic. That's it. Awesome. Very cool. All right. right yeah, man, thanks. Stoked. All right. That was great, Kyle. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind that, what, what went into it, and what's the reaction been? Um, so first of all, this is an online free movie. Uh, it came up on YouTube last week. And um, so what I do is I make short movies. Um, which, does that sound better? It's easier for me. Um, I make short movies and host them on uh, surfingforchange.com. And it's pretty much trips I take that then have an environmental or social cause tied to them. Um, and it was interesting how you were talking about um, you know, kids not being out in nature as much. Um, and I think that's really important. I think that people like Jack Johnson, I was talking to him and he was saying, he does a lot of like children's music now and like um, a huge amount of his work is put into getting kids engaged in the environment. And it's not, he's a really cool guy and loves kids, but it's actually a strategy of his to get kids involved in it at a really young age. So I totally think that people like Jack Johnson and musicians um, getting kids out there at a young age is really helping. Um, another thing I think is really important is framing the message positively and, and framing it in like a fun way rather than like a threatening like oh, global warming and scary world like more like hey this is a cool thing and we can help out. I think that's a way more effective um, way to reach a, a wider audience. Um, and I think that it it really is also like the the thing of like the problems being away. You know, I, the mo the title of this movie is "Where Is Away," and a big part of plastic pollution, the emphasis has been on the the garbage patch out in the middle of the ocean. And I 
as you notice, I didn't really talk about that very much in my movie because I feel like it's almost become a problem because it makes the problem seem like it's out in the middle of the ocean rather than where it really is, is kind of right in front of us on, on our doorsteps. And um, so I think that framing it in a positive way and just pointing out really simple solutions is really effective. Um, that's what I've noticed for me and, and making stuff short, I mean, definitely kids and all my friends have, you know, you want to be entertained and have fun while you're doing it. So the best thing I've noticed is just um, have fun doing it and show the fun that you're doing come across. Um, should we should we do questions till last? Well, we'll or? have uh, we'll have some time for questions okay. at the at the end. But uh, since I'm the moderator, I get to um, I get to grill you with, with whatever <laughs> I uh, I choose to. Um, but actually, I, I'd just be interested in your perspectives on people your age and this whole notion of outdoor experiences. I know California is different in many ways. It's got a great climate. You've got mountains. You've got water. When I lived out there, we were always outside. But I'm wondering if you see that issue um, as well, and, and what are some of the trends that you see? Yeah, like you said, I mean, I live in Santa Cruz, California, which is a lot of my friends. We do a lot of outdoor activities, and um, I don't know. That's that's a tough one. Um, again, like I said, just making it fun, you know, and not not scaring kids away from it. I think is really important, and having it be way more of like, hey, this is a cool thing that you can be a part of, is way more effective. Um, and you know, I heard recently my friend, his name's Dr. Jay Nichols, and he was saying how like kids when they're in like the teenage range, if they listen to a song, um, that song is more likely to then stay with them and have them like love that song for the rest of their lives more than any other time in their lives. So like I feel like teenagers and that time like getting messages out to that group is the most effective way that you can do it. Um, so I'd like to see more emphasis being put on, on that. And I think that just it's definitely headed there. I mean, you see people like Jack Johnson out there doing it, and he's not the only one. It's like there are a lot of people framing this issue in a really fun, positive way. That's a great message, and uh, I really appreciate it. And I'm a living example of one of those teenagers. It wasn't too late for me. Uh, I was 15, and the only reason I got into scuba diving was because I was watching Lloyd Bridges on the old uh, Sea Hunt reruns and just thought the gear looked pretty cool and uh, wanted to go down and have adventures. Um, I, you know, I was from Philadelphia. I didn't have much experience underwater, and that kind of came later, but I was 15. It worked. We'll come back to that during question and answer, I think. I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrea Neal as our next speaker. She is the founder and president of Blue Ocean Science and the science advisor for Jean-Michel Cousteau's Ocean Futures Society. She's also the principal investigator for Project Kaise uh, excuse me, in 2009 and one of the principal investigators for the 2011 it's so a 2011 Lone Ranger Transatlantic Investigation, I love the name of that, of uh, marine pollutants with the Schmidt o Ocean Institute. She has over 13 years of experience with the scientific community and she specializes in creating unique partnerships with people to create healthier oceans through the accurate understanding of our impact on the environment and um, using well-executed ex action plans bearing fruitful results. That's an important lesson. Please welcome Dr. Andrea Neal. <laughs> 